Hello, this is my second JavaScript project on the wizard architecture, and I make no apology for that. I like wizards. Expect to see more wizards on this channel than in a Harry Potter book. If you're not familiar with the wizard architecture, then I would strongly recommend that you visit my video explaining it before watching this one. Things will make a lot more sense here if you do. Hey, don't look at me like that. I need the views and watch time, and I can't afford to be too fussy about how I get them. This time, I'm showing you the recurrent version, where Wizard is given an initial input pattern and produces an output based on it. The whole process takes place on a series of individual time steps, individual ticks of the clock, if you like. On the first tick, the input pattern is presented to Wizard and the discriminators produce their output. This output is then used as the next input for Wizard on the second tick, which produces another output pattern, used as the input on tick three. The whole process repeats until Wizard's output stabilizes, at which point we take a look at it and see what's what. Here's what I mean. The Wizard network takes its input from a square grid, 16 pixels by 16. Since it has to produce output that can be fed back as input on future time steps, then there must also be a square grid of discriminators, 16 by 16. Clearly, Wizard isn't going to produce anything sensible if it hasn't learned anything, so the first thing to do is to give it something to learn. Here you can see a simple picture of a man. This is presented on the grid, and Wizard is told to learn it. In the original version of Wizard that I showed you, discriminators had to learn patterns by producing an output value of 1 whenever that pattern was presented. In the recurrent case, it's a little different. In this case, discriminators learn a pattern by duplicating it on the output, so that when this picture of a man appears at the input, the outputs match it exactly. Any discriminator whose position corresponds to a zero in the original image will be trained to produce a zero on seeing the man. Any discriminator whose position corresponds to a one in the original will be trained to produce a one. Now the smarter ones amongst you, by which I mean absolutely everybody because you're all very smart, of course, will have realised that this image represents some sort of dead end when it comes to processing. The output of the discriminators are used as the next input so presenting the man to the discriminators means you get exactly the same input for the next time step, and nothing can ever change. Such a pattern is called an attractor, as any other input pattern that happens to produce that man as the discriminator output will result in the discriminators being stuck in that state until the program stops running. It's sometimes called an attractor basin, using the analogy of a ball rolling downhill. It carries on rolling until it reaches the lowest point in the landscape, then it stops, and can't escape from that point. Having learned the picture of a man, we present Wizard with an input pattern that looks nothing like a man, and tell it to start cycling. Wizard stumbles around, but if it's only learned one pattern, then there's a good chance that it will hit upon some pattern that will take it inexorably along the path towards the picture of the man. Of course, we might be unlucky, and Wizard might get stuck in some other attractor state that doesn't represent anything in particular, or it might cycle continuously without ever hitting on the pattern that we want. It all depends on how the system has been set up. Of course, things get even trickier if we get Wizard to auto-associate. That's what we call it when Wizard learns one pattern on the inputs and exactly the same one on the outputs. Or to associate more than one pattern. Now we can't be sure which of the learned patterns it will settle on, if any. Still, we'll jump that hurdle when we come to it. Here's the screen and you can see that it has certain things in common with last week's project. That large grid, 16 by 16, that dominates the screen is where the input patterns are created. However, unlike the wizard pattern recognizer, it does not show different sets of discriminators. That's because there is only one set of discriminators. One thing you see a lot of is buttons. In fact, if that screen had any more buttons on it, it would be a French accordion. Clear grid and learn, you'll recognize from last week. Also, save discriminators and load discriminators. However, there are now two run buttons to get Wizard to process the pattern sitting on the grid at the moment. A button to add noise to the image, and two more buttons to load and save the current grid pattern. This is a new option that I added because of the size of that grid. When it was only 8x8, it wasn't that hard simply to recreate any image you wanted, but now that it's four times as large, it's probably worth adding that feature. At the bottom of the screen, there's a text area, which is used for saving and loading. It's not that easy to see, 
so I've highlighted it with the HTML code I used to create it. The name of this text area is Save Load. OK, down to the nitty gritty. This is the point where I tell you to go and watch the video for the JavaScript wizard demonstration from last week, as a lot of what I've been saying here duplicates stuff from that. Link, as always, in the description. I'll be explaining the whole program, as I always do, but when I've already covered something in last week's video, I won't be dwelling on the same thing this time round. Well, what can I say? I've already explained that I need to watch time on my videos, so help me out here. Anyway, you'll recognise num rows and num calls here as being the size of the grid. Both 16, but please make them as large as you like, consistent with being able to fit the grid on the screen, naturally. Each discriminator has the number of inputs given by num imps, which I have specified as four. These global variables are all defined in the JavaScript block in the header section to the page, as they are needed when constructing the screen. Like this. This draws the grid, which is created as a table in HTML. JavaScript is used to draw each row using a for loop, and within that loop, each grid square is drawn as a table cell, using another for loop. The cells themselves contain small square graphics, either 0.png for a blank white square, or 1.png for a black square. I include both these graphics on my web page for you to download, but there's no reason why you can't create your own. Indeed, if you intend to make your grid substantially larger, you might want to make these squares a little smaller. Each image is also given a name, consisting of the letter P followed by the row and column number, so that the image can be changed from white to black and back again by the program. You'll recognise a lot of these variables from the last project. PWR gives the total number of binary values in each discriminator, which depends on the number of inputs. In this case, num imps is 4, which means that they can address a total of 2 to the power of 4 values, i.e. 16 values. The input grid is stored in array GD. This is declared as a one-dimensional array here, but in function clear grid, called next, each of these array elements is declared to be an array in itself, thereby turning it into a two-dimensional one. The discriminators themselves are set up in array discrims. This is also one-dimensional at the moment, but it is about to be made a two-dimensional array in function initialize discriminators. In fact, it's going to be made a two-dimensional array exactly the same size as the input grid itself, with num rows rows and num calls columns so that the discriminator outputs can be used to replace the input pattern. The array nums and the two variables lines and ln will come across in due course, but I will give a special mention to Boolean variable running, initially set to false. The program has two running modes. You can either process one step, i.e. one pass through the discriminators, in which case running is false, or you can get it to run one step after another continuously when running is true. Function initialize discriminators sets up the discriminators themselves with all their values and connections, and as you can imagine, it is complicated enough to be split over two screens. Here's the first part, and you can see the nested for loops looking very similar to the ones used to display the grid, so that each discriminator has a row number and a column number in a two dimensional array. Within that array, the discriminator is set up as a set containing an array of values where the discriminator stores the data it has learned, and a set of row and column numbers that tell you where on the input grid it draws its inputs from. It has num imps inputs, so it will need num imps row values and num imps column values. The second half of initialized discriminators assigns input squares on the grid to each of the input address lines of each discriminator. I've chosen to do this in a slightly different way. Namely, taking each input in turn, i.e. the first input for each of the discriminators, then the second input for each, and so on, and for each of them, assigning all the grid pixels to all the discriminators. So, we start with the first input. The function random list arranges all the grid positions in a random order, effectively in the case where we have 16 rows of 16 columns, i.e. 256 values, the function puts the numbers 0 to 255 in a random order in the array nums. Look at last week's video if you want more details on that function. Each of those rows is assigned to the first inputs of the 16 rows out of 16 columns of discriminators. 
Then we re-randomize the list of numbers and use the new order to assign each grid pixel to the second inputs of the discriminators, and so on. Assigning connections this way ensures that the connections are as random as we can make them, and that no two discriminators have the same identical set of input connections. Function learn deserves a mention, although it is so simple. In this case, the inputs of each discriminator are read from the pattern grid using function get address, and the value corresponding to that address in the discriminator is set to the same value in the pattern grid that matches the position of the discriminator. For instance, for the discriminator in row 7, column 13, the values in the grid corresponding to its input addresses are read in and the address calculated from them. Let's say they produce a value of 8. Slot number 8 in the discriminator in row 7, column 13 is set to the same value as the pixel in row 7, column 13 of the pattern grid, whether it's a 1 or a 0. The main donkey work of the program is done by function run one step, which causes the discriminators to do their thing just once, and then copies the outputs that they produce back into array GD, ready for display and to run the next time. It needs a temporary array called outPT to hold the outputs of the discriminators until they've all finished calculating. If we stored those outputs back in array GD the moment they were calculated, then we will be overwriting values that we need for the calculations we're carrying out. No, no. We need to keep those calculated values on one side until we don't need the values in GD anymore, and then use them to overwrite what's in GD. While we're at it, we'll use the new values to update the graphics in the pattern grid by changing the SRC property of each square image. The final instruction in function run step is to check the variable running. If this is true, it indicates that the user wants wizard to run continuously. If that is the case, then run step sets a timer going that automatically calls run step once again, one second later, 1000 milliseconds. The variable running is controlled by function run continuously. This is called when you click on the screen button marked run continuously. And if you look at the HTML code for the screen, you'll see that that button is the only one that's been given a name, run but. Here's why. The variable running starts off as false to indicate that wizard will only run one step. Click on the button marked run one step, and that's precisely what happens. It calls function run one step which at the end simply terminates. However, if you click on run continuously, then it sets running to true before it calls run one step. This time, when run one step reaches the end, it tests variable running, finds that it's true, and calls itself again a second later. That way, run one step will repeat indefinitely. At least it will until variable running becomes false. In that case, the timer is not set, and run one step terminates normally. This happens when you click on button run continuously a second time. That sets running to false, so that when run one step reaches the end, it won't set itself up to repeat. You'll notice also that whenever you click on the button, the caption on that button is changed. When you set wizard running continuously, the caption is changed to stop running. If wizard is running already, clicking on the button stops it, and the caption is changed back to run continuously. That's why the button had to have a name, so that JavaScript can refer to it easily. One function that has no equivalent in last week's project is add noise. This is an easy way to corrupt a pattern by randomly changing its ones to zeros and vice versa. This function reads a number from the text field noise, which you can see next to the add noise button. There's no check that this is a number, it's just assumed. That number is treated as a percentage. The function goes through every pixel in the grid, and if a random number in the range 0 to 1 is less than the percentage, that pixel is changed. It's an easy way to create a simple random pattern. Just choose your percentage, 50 is a good value, then clear the grid and click the Add Noise button to turn about half those white squares black. Easy. I'll just give a brief description of the saving and loading process, and then we can get on with seeing how the system performs. The Save Discriminator button calls function save discrims to write the values and input addresses of all those discriminators to the text area at the bottom of the screen. The procedure should be familiar from last week. A variable s is set up as an empty string. 
then two nested for loops go through each of the discriminators in turn. And for every discriminator, the function adds every slot value to S, followed by another loop that adds the row and column values to S as well. All values are separated by control N characters to ensure that the numbers will appear on successive lines. Once all the data for each discriminator has been stored in S, the whole thing is placed into the value property of the text area, save load, so that it all appears on the screen. As a final courtesy, the function causes the text in the text area to be selected, just so you can copy and paste it into Notepad or whatever. Function load discrims works in a similar way to save discrims, except in reverse. This time the data is loaded from the text area and stored in string S. This is then split into lines, each of which represents a single number. Again, we have the nested for loops going through all the discriminators, and for each one, additional for loops feed the slot values, followed by the row and column coordinates, to the address lines in the same order in which they were stored. The function getLine reads each line in turn from the array lines, where the split function has stored them. There is one difference from last week's version of getLine. In last week's project, Function getLine had to extract both names and numbers from the stored data, and the function eval had to be placed around some calls to getLine whenever we needed a number. However, this week the only data that is stored is numeric, so the call to eval can be included inside getLine itself. The function is therefore guaranteed to return a number rather than a string. There are two more functions to save and load the grid patterns but they work in a very similar way to save discrims and load discrims, so I won't go over them here. Take a look at the code and compare it with the two functions that you see above. Right, so much for the dull part, where I go through the code and explain it almost line by line, yawn. Now, let's see how the system performs in the field. Here you see two simple images I've drawn on the grid and I've saved in the discriminators. The situation is going to be harder than the example with the man, because this time there are two attractors competing with each other. Any random starting pattern could end up settling on either of these two pictures, or indeed neither. Let's try one. We start with a partial picture consisting of just the church tower. Clearly, Wizard should recreate the image of the church from this rather than the house. Let's click on Run Continuously and see what happens. Well, that was disappointing, wasn't it? Wizard reaches this pattern and stays there. It has found an attractor, but not the one we wanted. You might notice that small snippets of the church roof and parts of the windows have been reconstructed, but not the entire church, and the tower itself has been comprehensively dismantled. Oh well, it doesn't always work. In fact, I've tried this pair of images, house and church, various times on Wizard, each time with a different configuration of input addresses and different starting points. Sometimes a smattering of unrelated pixels, sometimes sections of one of the two images, sometimes the entire image with a bit of noise added. And generally speaking, Wizard has difficulty with this house and church. Maybe it's because the two images have too many pixels in common, both ones and zeros. Okay then, what about a series of images that have no black pixels in common? Take a look at these four arrows, each pointing towards a different corner of the grid. If you look carefully, you'll see that no two arrows have a single black pixel in common. Right then, let's start with nothing but noise at the 20% level on what was originally a blank grid and see if we get a better result. Place your bets, folks. Right, the end of our blue. We have a winner, bottom right. In that case, it didn't take long before we could see which direction that was going in. So, there you are, the recurrent wizard architecture. On some patterns it works well, on others it simply flounders around. Please let me know in the comments how you get on with it, and indeed, how you've managed to improve it. Also, if you want to, please share this video amongst others who might find it interesting, or click on the like button. Much appreciated. Thank you.